Welcome to Questions and Answers from Quarantine with Pastor Chris McMichael. Hello there. Welcome to Questions and Answers from Quarantine, episode 36, recording on a Sunday night before evening service, and I'm uh, going to talk to you about music. I had some questions, several of them sent to me about music, so that's what we're going to address now. We'll just call it, What About Music? So let me read you this list of questions, and we'll see how accurately we can possibly answer this in our allotted time here. First question says, does it matter what kind of music we listen to outside of church services? Short answer, absolutely. If worship music drove away evil spirits from King Saul and brought the presence of God, and also if music, excuse me, if demonic music can invite demons, is there a third category of neutral or harmless music? I would say yes, and we'll explain all these more in a moment. Yeah, there, there, there is neutral secular music. What about the very worldly music that brings no glory to God, but has the bad words bleeped out of that? Is that just as bad? Would carnal or demonic music be classified as what Dr. Mark Barclay calls demon bait? If so, can you tell, uh, can you please explain? All right, so let me unpack that. There's a lot of different questions, all kind of uh, aimed, it looks like, to kind of build the doctrine and understanding about music. Let's first look at Psalm 22. And it says in um, verse 3, But thou art holy, God is holy. Thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. I have a cross-reference in my Bible. Let me see if that adds anything else to our discussion here. I wasn't prepared to look at that. Um, let's see, it's Deuteronomy he is thy praise and he is thy God. He hath done for thee great things and terrible things which thy eyes have seen. Okay, it doesn't add much to our discussion here. He is the one, the holy one that inhabits the praises of Israel. We see something there very critical right from the get-go in that music controls atmosphere. I think anybody that's been around music any bit at all understands this. Uh, music producers and Hollywood producers understand this more than anything. If you were to take a very somber scene in a movie and change the music up on it, you would totally have a different scene. In fact, music is so powerful to even the pagan who doesn't know anything about the spirit realm, they will actually film and edit a whole movie to the music playing in the background. They'll edit music, or excuse me, edit a movie to a tempo. They'll film a whole sequence with a song, the director will, with a song in their head. And they want that song to kind of help narrate the story. And that, they play that to dramatic effect, emotional effect. You can tell in romantic movies, there's this sweeping love music in the background. And you know they're going to be reunited. Or tension, uh, thrillers and, and war movies and even scary movies. You can tell by the music changing that the, the, the storyline is about to intensify. We watch a, a children's program with our kids called Superbook, produced by Christian Broadcast Network, great set of cartoons for kids. And uh, they were watching it the other day and the music began to change. I don't remember what the story was. It might've been um, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and mama's in there cutting, cooking. And she says, oh, music's changing. Something's about to happen. Even something as simple as a children's animated feature talking about Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uses music to a dramatic effect. All of that shows what we already know, that music controls the atmosphere. Music controls the atmosphere. God inhabits the praises of Israel. God does not inhabit a mosque because there are no praises towards the God of heaven in a mosque. God does not inhabit a Mormon tabernacle. God does not inhabit a Unitarian church. God does not inhabit an Ozzy Osbourne concert. God does not inhabit a Lady Gaga concert. God does not inhabit a jazz concert or your kid's middle school concert. God inhabits his praises. And that is why it's so critical we have anointed worship or heartfelt worship that magnifies and praises God because when we begin to produce that aroma out of our heart, the spirit realm answers it and his presence comes and fills it. 
On the flip side, if music is demonic, if music is inspired by Satan and sung to his praises, demons will come rapidly. They'll hear their own cry in the spirit. They'll hear their own words and their inspiration, and they'll come to that thing rapidly as well. One of the other issues, and this really is another topic that could be four or five weeks or months worth of teaching, Ezekiel chapter 28 talks about Satan. And how he was when he was still known as Lucifer, star of the morning. Lucifer is his angelic name. Lucifer is a beautiful name. Who Lucifer has become is Satan, the accuser of the brethren. But Lucifer is just as much a God-appointed name as Michael or Gabriel is. We just know that Lucifer fell and now he's Satan. It talks about in Ezekiel 28 verse 13, um, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold. It talks about how beautiful he was and, and how all these precious things were his ordination or his, his ornate, his ornation. And then it says, The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I, and I have set thee so. We see that in verse 13, that not only was Lucifer beautiful, but he was created to produce music. And that's what makes music such a powerful force that we must contend for and we must contend with. And we can't take music lightly. There is a very small margin of music that can be dubbed neutral. And outside of this very narrow margin, and that margin differs for everybody, and I'll explain that here in a moment. Because that margin of neutral music is so narrow, we have to be very careful in the music that we want to bring in the presence of God, in the music we know that can elicit sin, temptation, and even demons. And yes, there is some music that will harness the power of demons. Um, if music, and then come back to this question, if music drove away evil spirits from King Saul and brought the presence of God, and also if demonic music can invite demons, is there a third category of neutral or harmless, harmless music? So we do know that story from 1 Samuel that when uh, King Saul, when God's presence departed him, an evil spirit came and began to buffet him. He called for David. David would come and play the harp. David was anointed. We know David was a great worship leader. There was this natural anointing on David to worship God. And when David would play his harp unto the Lord, the presence of God would come down, not for Saul's sake, but for the worship's sake. And that anointing that would manifest as little David would play his harp, it would benefit King Saul who sat in the same room. That's an instance of the presence of God coming in, filling a room because of the praises being offered up. And also I should note, there were no words being sung. He just played the harp. So there is such thing as chords and there is such things as a motive and a music that can bring in demonic darkness. In this case with David, it drove off the evil spirit. And I, I tell a famous story, famous to my congregation because I've told it a few times. I was once in Poland on a mission trip. I was with a bunch of Baptists and I evangelized a young kid named Petra, which is Polish for Peter. And he was into demonic music. He didn't speak a bit of English, but he liked this demonic, this satanic band out of the U.S. whose name I can't remember. But as he testified to us through the Polish translator, he would listen to this hard rock in American English. And even with headphones on, because his parents didn't let him listen to it. This is in the uh, mid to late 90s. This is right after communism fell in Poland. He said, I listened to the music on cassette. And so I know nobody could hear the music but my ears. He said, listening to that music that I knew was worshiping Satan, though I didn't understand the words, he said, I could feel darkness come in and out of my room and I could feel entities come in and out of my body with me listening to it in my ears. Nothing, no stereo blaring, no music being outside, just the cassette straight to his ears. And so that, that's, uh, that speaks something. This was a Polish kid who was raised Catholic, who knew nothing about Jesus. In fact, to win him to Christ, he did not believe Jesus had been raised from the dead because he'd never been taught it. And I said, well, the Bible says so. And he says, really? And I, and I said, yeah, through the translator. He said, well, where? Well, I was just a 19 or 20 year old kid. I was like, I don't know. Where does the Bible say Jesus was raised from the dead? And then I thought it has to be at the end of one of the gospels. That's the conclusion of the story. He was raised from the dead. So I quickly turned over there. 
And I read it to this young kid. He was only three or four years younger than me. And he said, oh, I believe. So we prayed with him and he, he received Christ and gave his life to God and got born again. The question is, is there a third category of neutral or harmless music? And I say yes, but, and here's the big but, what might be neutral or harmless to you, because it's neither here nor there to you, it's just fun music to you, could be sinful or sin bait or emotional bait for somebody else. Music is so powerful, we associate it with experiences. There are love ballads, there are breakup songs, there are party songs, there are just summer songs. There are songs that you listen to in a rebellious state that have kind of creased your life and kind of define your emotional state and your heart state in that season. And you've been born again now or rededicated now and 20 years later, you go back and listen to that song that is neutral for a lot of people but for you, you almost begin to kind of twitch because you can remember the attitude you were in. Uh, ironically, just last night, uh, and concerning all this here, I was working out in my garage. I was doing a little workout on a Saturday night. And I was scrolling through some of my old music on my phone. And I wanted something a little upbeat. So I found what I would call neutral, just kind of neutral music. And it's kind of a little upbeat, a little tempo, a little bit of a hip hop beat to it clean, lyrics are clean. And I, I, an artist, I won't name the artist, but I listened to, had two or three of his songs on my song, on my playlist. So I just was playing it. I knew the songs would run out. I'd have to go to another playlist before the workout was done. But I get to the third song and I remember as soon as that song came on, I listened to that song for the first time 20 years ago. I was a youth pastor and I was going through hell on earth. And I remember waking up and my alarm, we had alarm clocks in those days. Some of you young folks have no idea what an alarm clock is. But the alarm clock went off and you could set the alarm clock to go meh, meh, meh. Or you could set the alarm clock to go off to the radio, which you had to dial with the manual knob. And the alarm clock goes off and it's this song. And so I liked the song. It was very upbeat. It was very playful. But it was also my first introduction to this song at a very horrific season in my life. So 20 years later, I'm working out last night in my garage. I'm doing battle ropes. This song comes on and I'm instantly transported back to hell on earth 20 years ago. And even though that song went off and I went to a totally different set of music, the rest of my workout, my mind is like shell shocked. It's going back through all the emotions. It's going back through all the drama, all the pain, all the fighting I was having to do in that season. And I don't know if I'm gonna go listen to that song anymore because I don't wanna think about that stuff anymore. That's an example of music being neutral, but I associate it with a hard season in my life. And there's other music that folks might play and not think anything of it, but the person you're sitting next to, it defines a sinful part in their life. Even music from the 60s and 70s, which I think by and large, a lot of that's innocent and playful and fun, but the 60s and 70s were a very tumultuous time in our history. And so there might be some older folks, some boomers as they call them, who if they start listening to some Wilson Pickett or some Smokey Robinson or maybe some Credence Clearwater Revival, if they start listening to that music, they start repenting of new sins, all, or old sins all over again in their heart. And for them, it's not neutral music. We could, we, we might want to say classical music is, is innocent or neutral. Some of it, Johann Sebastian Bach wrote to the glory of God. Some of it, like Richard, Richard Wagner, he wrote to demons. And Hitler loved Wagner's music. Wagner, if you don't speak German, Wagner, Flight of the Valkyries and what have you. That music was dedicated to demons by Richard Wagner. And Hitler loved his music and would play it when he would meditate and seek demons. That music I can listen to, but if I listen to it too much, it's on the Fantasia soundtrack. If you know that movie and that music, uh, you can hear the whirlwind in the spirit behind 180-year-old classical music. So even though there's no words, there's a whirlwind behind it. Years ago, a couple years ago, let me just throw you some music history out. We were discussing music theory, and when music theory began to develop, in modern music theory, where you have your treble clef and your bass clef, and you have you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G notes, and the flats and sharps, and your modern music theory, before that you had modes. 
and Locrian mode and Dorian mode and all these modes of music. Well, when the church began to study out what the composers from four and 500 years ago were doing with music, they began to notice that there were certain chords that were called unresolved chords and certain modes that would not resolve themselves. They called those dark chords and dark modes. And the church actually in the middle ages uh, and into the Renaissance forbid the use of those in writing worship music. Well, you fast forward to the 1960s and a lot of your rock and roll bands who were going through college and music theory studied that and they decided to purposely and intentionally write their music with those chords and those modes and those unresolved sounds. And uh, sadly enough, a lot of modern day music uses the same kind of jive. So our secretary then, Miss Ginger, who's in heaven now, she and I were working through a lot of this and I was working on a video I wanted to do. And I said, hey, Ginger, how about you and your husband and Mr. Allen, three very anointed God-fearing musicians, let's write a song for this video that'll preach the gospel, but we want to expose darkness. Write a song using all those unresolved chords Use it, you write a song using, because she understood this way better than I will ever be able to, write a song using those chords that those musicians use to do rock and roll music. And I said, we'll just use it as a background track. So she wrote this little thing and we came in the sanctuary. We, we only laid down like two or three versions of it, two or three tracks. And from the moment they began to play this song that my anointed spirit filled holy woman of God, a grandmother worship leader, she wrote it, her husband, anointed of God, full of the Holy Ghost to lead worship, and my drummer, full of the Holy Ghost, fearing God. They played it. It changed the total atmosphere in my empty sanctuary. In fact, we only recorded, like I said, two takes of it. Every, we put everybody else out of the sanctuary. It was me, a sound guy, and three musicians, bass guitar, electric guitar, and drums. When it was all said and done, they were having, I think, a vacation Bible school meeting in the back. One of the musicians on the worship team comes running into the sanctuary and says, what are you guys doing in here? The whole church feels weird. <laughs> the whole church feels weird. And I said, I know, we just, we just cut a song. Now think about that. That's an experimentation. I did it on purpose. And as soon as we're done, I said, quit. That's it. That's enough. Quickly, turn on the sound system. Let's put some anointed worship in here and let's clear the atmosphere. Three anointed, clean, holy ghost, men and women of God, seasoned in praise and worship, very much adept to the spirit of God, could play chords, unresolved, chords that the middle-aged fathers recognized brought in a dark presence. That was their quote. These chords bring in a dark presence. We did it to do a video God instructed me to produce for the body of Christ and it brought in a dark presence in a sanctuary for the glory of God. That's how powerful music is. Is there a third neutral category? Yes, but you got to be careful. You got to be careful. Uh, what, about, what about very worldly music that brings no glory to God but has the bad words bleeped out? If it has to have the bad words bleeped out, you probably don't need to be listening to it at all. So just find something better. Let me also say this. Music has an attitude behind it. Music has a spirit behind it. Music has a flavor behind it. And let me give you my two cents on this. Uh, one of the issues we're having with modern worship right now is we're looking to the young kids to lead us, which is one of the dumbest things you could ever do because young kids, they don't even know how to find themselves to the house of God unless they're on the worship team. You don't put the novices out front. And yet we're turning to the 19 and 25 year olds to lead us. Now the problem with 19 and 25 year olds is that they're not sanctified yet. Most of them don't have a pastor and they have half their foot in the world and most of their musical inspirations are pure, are pure pagans. So we're seeing a new style of music coming to the church. A lot of it's techno, it's EDM, it's rave music. I mean, if, if you didn't see the lyrics and just watch the video, you would think you were watching some kind of crunk club in, uh, in Euro, some kind of Euro trash dance music. But that's what these young folks like. So they want to come and introduce that to the church. So the style of music's not the problem, but the spirit and the vibe on that music is the problem. So they bring it into the church and they smear Christian lyrics on it and they teach the rest of us this is the move of God, but it's not. We've got to make sure that we can judge music not by just its lyrics, but also by the spirit that has inspired the lyrics. Uh, five or six years ago, I was working out with my next door neighbor who was a youth pastor. 
and he would put on Pandora music and we were listening to hip hop. And most of the time I thought it was a Christian hip hop station. So we're doing some deadlifts and some squats and something. And this song comes on and it gets to going and it's hip hop. And I'm a hip hop guy from the old days. I, I dig it. Um, and this is new stuff. And all of a sudden this music's going and, and it's putting this thing on me. I'm a pastor. He's a youth pastor. His name was Phil. I want, I said, Phil, who is this? I want to, this music makes me want to throw you to the ground and pumpkin stomp your head. And he goes over to the Pandora. He says, this is Lecrae. Well, I knew who Lecrae was, but Lecrae used to have some good music. I don't mean to throw him under the bus now. This is five or six years ago. Maybe he's turned things around. I didn't know who it was. I just know the vibe on that music. I couldn't hear the lyrics. It made me want to turn violent. And it, I looked at my friend, a pastor who I'm working out with. I want to grab him, throw him to the ground, and just start stomping his head like gang warfare. And I said, this song is not of God. I can tell what it's wanting to do to me. You got to be able to judge music by what it wants you to do. Even my, my eight-year-old and my six-year-old get this. I said, girls, if we put on worship music, what will you want to do? They said, worship, daddy. If we put on dancing music, what will you want to do? I want to worship. If I put on fight music, what will you want to do? I want to fight. <laughs> if you remember the old, uh, there was an old movie back in the 90s called Mortal Kombat. It was based on the video game. And, and it was a very high energy. I never saw the movie, but I always saw the trailer for it. And it had this techno rave, Mortal Kombat. And it was just this driving beat because it produces an energy that makes you want to fight. You would never put Tchaikovsky to that fight scene. You'd never have um, any of those classical. You'd never put a ballet to that. You'd never put Swan Lake to that. You'd never put Peter Wolf to that. It just wouldn't happen. You might could put Peter Gunn to it, but you're not going to put Swan Lake or anything else to it because it just totally diffuses the energy. Would carnal or demonic music be classified as what Dr. Barclay calls demon bait? Absolutely. There is certain music, it puts you, put, you put it on, it makes you want to do stuff. There's, there's music that makes folks want to have sex. There's music that makes folks want to fight. There's a reason people put on driving music to lift weights. There's a reason people put on music to train to fight. There, there's a reason people change music and they want something. It sets the atmosphere. In my church, my sound guys will get new worship. We're always adding new worship. I can judge a song in the first three or four measures. And I'll tell them, I don't know what that song is. Delete it. Never play that in my church again. Because I can judge it by the Spirit of God. That whatever's on it is not what God wants for my service. It might bless that individual in private, but it's not helping my ministry. You got to be able to judge these things by the Holy Spirit of God. Know this first and foremost, Satan was the first worship leader and he hasn't lost his skill. And God inhabits the holy praises of his people. And you've got to be able to discern between God's music and Satan's music. And the road in between is a very thin margin and it's getting narrower and narrower every day. All right, a lot of topic there. Hopefully that helps you. See you next time. Continue praying for our nation. Love you. Call you blessed in Jesus' name.